This video is made possible by the Servid Livestock Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit that's mission is to facilitate public education about the agricultural and economic value of raising deer. Two years ago, we used to have over 800 white-tailed deer in our facility. But because of one CWD positive deer, today we're down to 250. It makes me feel hollow. Hollow, mad, pissed off, in tears, tearing me apart. Howdy everybody, my name is Keith Warren, and if you love white-tailed deer like I do, and you're concerned about their future, the following program that we're gonna present will shed some light on an extremely important issue that's facing the white-tailed deer, white-tailed deer breeders, white-tailed deer hunters, landowners, and anybody who is a white-tail enthusiast. The focus of this video is how one deer breeding facility in Texas is committed to finding a better way to deal with an infectious disease that affects white-tailed deer, mule deer, elk, red deer, psycho deer, moose, and other species that are in the cervid family. This infectious disease is called chronic wasting disease, otherwise known as CWD. I'm confident that by the end of this video, you'll know that there is a better way for deer breeding facilities to deal with CWD than to be forced to kill all the deer in a deer breeding program. With all infectious diseases, there are guidelines, rules, and regulations that establish importance of disease control and how to prevent an outbreak. Anyone that's been following CWD and monitoring the progression of the disease is familiar with how quickly it's now spreading across the landscape. CWD is a wasting disease, much like mad cow disease, and in almost every piece of literature written, it will say CWD is always fatal. But is that a true statement? Is CWD fatal or could it possibly be that deer could die from pneumonia, a hunter's bullet, or hit by a vehicle and later discovered that it was a CWD positive deer? This does not mean that the deer died of CWD. It died with CWD. How is this happening? Why is it happening? And maybe a better question is, can it be stopped? Let's look at how CWD can be spread. We know that CWD can be spread from one deer to another, but we also know that CWD can be spread by hunters that unknowingly take a legally harvested CWD positive animal and move it from one location to another so they can process the meat, and then they discard the remains. CWD can be spread by predators that carry animal parts from one location to another. CWD can be spread by crows that feed on a CWD positive deer and then migrate from one area to another. CWD can be spread by transferring it in soil that could be on someone's shoes or on the underside of a vehicle. CWD is also found in plant matter and more. In other words, CWD is spread in countless ways, not just from deer to deer contact. When you realize how many ways CWD can actually be spread, it comes as no surprise that CWD is now showing up in new areas all the time, and you can rest assured it's going to continue showing up in more new areas in the future. But why is it that CWD is actually showing up in these particular areas? It's not because CWD is killing off a bunch of animals. It's because these are the areas that CWD is actually being looked for. For example, on Texas deer breeder sites, like the one we'll feature on today's program, Every deer that dies or leaves the breeding facility for any reason must be tested for CWD. Meanwhile, in other areas, there's no CWD testing at all. So where will you find CWD? The answer is simple, where you look for it. That's the reason it's been found at a much higher rate in deer breeding facilities. So how long has CWD been around? It was first discovered in a Colorado research facility back in the 60s. We said earlier, in almost every piece of literature written about CWD, the first thing you'll read is that it's always fatal. Well, if that's the case, then how is it that in areas that have as high as a 40% prevalency rate of CWD, that the population there of the cervid species still grows? Maybe it's not such a devastating disease as we're being led to believe. If CWD was such a devastating disease, then certainly there would be one example, just one, 
of how CWD has wiped out a deer herd. But the truth is, CWD has never wiped out a deer herd, but testing for CWD has. In Texas, for example, when a case of CWD has been discovered in a deer breeding facility, historically has meant a complete depopulation of all the animals in that facility. And as you can imagine, this depopulating of 100% of the deer has been devastating to landowners and communities, and for many reasons. But what's really shocking is that the owner of that CWD positive deer facility has to pay for their own animals to be put down. The discovery of CWD, or even the fear of the possibility of having CWD on a piece of property, impacts property values, tax revenues, and negatively impacts hunter participation, which also has a direct negative impact on rural areas. Are some deer more susceptible to CWD than others? Can there be some kind of genetic protection from CWD that some deer may have? We'll answer those questions and a lot more in this video. On this video, we'll tell you about a new research program being conducted at a deer breeding facility in Texas. Many deer breeders and whitetail enthusiasts are hopeful this research will change the way when a positive case of CWD is discovered in a deer breeding facility, it will be handled differently in the future. Let's get started. I'm Jason Molitor, CEO of Ox Ranch, located northwest of Uvalde, Texas. Ox Ranch is an 18,000 acre hunting ranch. We also have non-hunting ox safaris, drive tanks, and we also have ox genetics, which is our 650 acre breeding ranch north of Canipa, Texas. At Ox Genetics, we have 35 species of exotics, everything from Munt Jack to Sable, Bongo, Lesser Kudu, Red Stag, Chinese White Lip Deer, and of course, we've got the Whitetail Breeding Program over there as well. So we started Ox Genetics for the Whitetails to primarily improve the genetics at the main ranch here at Ox Ranch. And then with the exotics, of course, we bring Starkers over there for the ranch here, but also for other ranches, to start their breeding programs. The whitetail deer were in what we called phase one when we started there, where we built a, a whitetail handling facility and all the pens. And through that facility, we also worked some other non-susceptible animals like Inyala and Sotatunga. Then we decided to do phase two, where we were include other susceptible species like elk, Sika, muntjac. We got with Texas Animal Health and USDA and made sure we followed all the guidelines to keep alleyways and separation from these and built a complete new facility to just handle these other susceptible species for CWD. There are two ways to test for CWD. Postmortem is the way to test dead animals. Postmortem testing is when the brain stem, otherwise known as the obex, is removed as well as the lymph nodes. These samples are sent to the lab for testing. The other way CWD can be tested is through a live anti-mortem test, which is now required by the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department in order to move any deer from any breeding facility. Live testing is done by removal of a tissue sample from either the rectum or tonsils. These samples are submitted for testing as well. Not until a non-detected sample is confirmed can a deer be removed from a deer breeding facility. But when Ox Ranch Genetics originally purchased their deer to start their deer breeding program, live testing was not required. However, Ox Ranch Genetics voluntarily chose to live test every animal for CWD, so they had the assurance that these deer were not detected for the disease. My name is Tommy Sowell, and I'm the manager here at Ox Ranch Genetics in Canipa, Texas. When we first started out, we purchased some deer and had every single one of them live tested for chronic wasting disease. All came back not detected. The idea was we would only bring in new genetics through AI. After three or four years and no new CWD cases in the state of Texas, we decided we needed to bring in some other breeders and, and went looking to uh, bring in some other bucks for live covers. Our numbers were growing and it was getting simply too expensive to AI all of our does. So we purchased this one breeder buck from a seven year certified herd. A certified herd is a herd that a licensed deer breeder operates and demonstrates that their herds are low risk for CWD. 
Program participation means engaging in rigorous CWD surveillance and biosecurity measures. That buck is the reason that we are in the position we are in today, because he was the one and only that tested positive for CWD. And he just so happened to be the only deer that we did not live CWD test before bringing him into the facility. He bred does for two years in a row, perfectly healthy deer, towards the end of breeding season and he was, he was a bit wore down, but so were our other breeder bucks. We didn't think, think much of it. A few months later, we got a call and was notified that the breeder that we had purchased this deer from had tested positive for CWD and we were required to euthanize and CWD test this deer. And turns out he was positive. When we found out this deer was positive, it was like one of the biggest blows I've ever felt. We had tried to be so careful, only purchasing from an outside facility that was seven years certified. We felt like after all the years that there was no other cases in Texas that we were safe with doing so. And it was like all these years of work were just going to come to an immediate end because we all know that in previous cases, total herd depopulation has been the only answer from Texas Parks and Wildlife. I mentioned earlier that live testing is now required by the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department to move a deer from one deer breeding facility, say to a release site or to another deer breeding facility. And it's clear that this live testing is working because it's detecting infected animals prior to movement. One of the problems that exists is that it takes many months to receive a proposed herd plan from the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, and that's problematic because of the time it takes to receive a herd plan. If CWD is such a threat, don't the regulatory authorities have an obligation to work quickly to develop a herd plan? Keep in mind, supposedly, CWD is such a contagious disease, and if so, then why the excessive amount of time required to get a herd plan? So if it takes months for a herd plan to develop, it suggested that rather than wait for a herd plan to be presented and then approved, why isn't aggressive action taken to avoid the risk of spreading the disease? So after getting our positive results on him, we took a very aggressive approach. Uh, we didn't want it to get out of hand, so we ended up euthanizing and postmortem testing the does that he bred for two years and any other deer that were in pens that he previously resided in. We euthanized all of his fawns as well. All just so happened to come back not detected. During the next five months, we were not allowed to move deer around, run them through the facility, take care of them. Going into breeding season, I had numerous hard horn bucks that were all together in the same pen and ended up losing half of them due to fighting all because Parks and Wildlife would not let us move them. There was numerous other deer that died not being able to treat them the way that they need to be treated, all because we couldn't move them. This is with no herd plan. This is just being locked down and no urgency on getting us a herd plan and, and, and taking the next step. When I told the owner about the fact that we had a positive and I told him, I said, I can't accept that we're going to kill all the deer in the herd. And I'd heard of Dr. Seabury and some of the research he had been doing. And so I reached out to him, started talking with him, started talking with Texas Parks and Wildlife, and just trying to find a way that we didn't have to do a total depopulation of the herd. I'm Chris Seabury. I'm a tenured professor at Texas A&M at the School of Veterinary Medicine. And I specialize in genetic improvement of livestock for production and animal health traits. I also am a trained wildlife biologist as well. And so I, I felt like I was perfectly poised to assist Ox Ranch genetics. My general background on prion diseases is that I essentially have worked on them since I was a graduate student, focusing on the genetic aspects of Scrapey, uh, CWD, and BSE, uh, also known as mad cow disease. Within those projects, I worked on deducing the genetic underpinnings of disease, things that are natural genetic sources of variation that either increase susceptibility or decrease susceptibility. In about 2019, I was able to start taking a very comprehensive, large-scale approach 
to CWD and, and farmed whitetail deer all across North America. That allowed me to do several first things, estimate the heritability of differences in susceptibility, and also find all the sources of genetic variation that were most strongly associated with increasing susceptibility or decreased susceptibility. When we genetically profile these animals through a 501c5 agricultural nonprofit called North American Deer Registry, we simply can develop a genetic profile of the animal based on all these natural genetic sources of variation and, and essentially sum it up to a numerical score. And that numerical score, it represents the level of durability that the deer has for CWD. Um, if the deer is scoring into the positive range and it has uh, two copies of the G allele at codon 96, well then that deer would be considered moderately to highly susceptible. If the deer has its score is scoring well into the negative range of numbers and it is not a codon 96 GG animal, then that animal would be considered more durable. And of course, there's a spectrum of durability. It's not a yes or no question. It's not a pregnancy test. You know, the, the beauty of the situation is that everyone has the opportunity for genetic improvement and that genetic improvement is actually measurable. So when you engage in this test and you use it in your breeding program, you can actually see and quantify how much genetic improvement you're making so that you know that you're going in the right direction. So we were sort of perfectly poised to implement a selective breeding program at Ox Genetics. We felt like we had something that we could offer to them. If we were going to attempt to suppress CWD in any herd and essentially clean up a herd, what would it take to do that? And it, it really boils down to what we call the leave no doubt plan, where it's a combination of best management practices as well as genetic selection and selective breeding. One of the first things that we did was we were required to, to perform live testing. So we literally bought hundreds of pairs of Metzenbaum scissors, forceps, so that all the tools that would be used had only been used at Ox Ranch Genetics. What we did was develop an assembly line, if you will, so that we could clean all those tools with appropriate bleach solution after they were used by each animal so that every single animal would have a new freshly cleaned tool used on it for live testing. So we implemented that, got a lot of the live testing done, finished up genetic screening of the entire herd, and that's when we sat down to develop a, a breeding plan solely based on reducing CWD prevalence to the point where we have zero prevalence moving forward. So all of the breeding decisions were made based on that in consultation with Jason Molitor and Ox Ranch Genetics and their staff. Part of our herd plan is that we have to live test all of our deer in our facility once a year. This is something that continuing on as long as we're under this herd plan, we'll have to test 100% of our deer live at least once a year. Last year we spent 10 days, approximately 10 hours a day, uh, processing over 800 deer. We were doing two tests on those at that time. Today we're going to run things through the chute and we're going to take rectal tests. You'll see the process of the deer going into the chute. We're going to take a forcep and we're going to expose the rectal mucosa and I'll take a little snippet of that. It's not terribly painful to the deer and they'll go on back to their pen and heal and go on being normal but the process of just getting the deer from staging from where their pen is through the facility and back is very stressful on them. There is danger even though we're taking every precaution to, to take care of the deer, but just handling that many whitetails is there's gonna be deaths. Now that we have to run these deer through the barn an extra time every year, there's always an added risk to it. Two days ago, we did 130 of our deer and uh, we've lost three of them so far to this process. So this is not without risk to the deer every time that we do them. So not only do you have the added costs of 12 people for the day and all the cost of the tests and the buying new scissors and forceps and everything every time to you know you lost three deer that's a that's a minimum of five thousand dollars a deer that you've lost 
We have deer stages in the back. We're bringing them up one by one. Dr. Pat is collecting the rectal sample. He's passing that sample off. That sample gets placed into a cassette. From the cassette, it goes into a jar of formalin and is packaged away to send off to the lab. The utensils used on each deer are cleaned between each deer. The utensils go into a bleach solution. They sit in there for five minutes. They're then rinsed, cleaned off, dried, and they're ready for the next year. So for now, we have to do this. Even though I don't completely agree with it, it kind of is what it is. We've got a few more years left of live testing and we'll get through it uh, one way or another. Our first year they required us to do tonsil and rectal, which was a much more invasive process for the deer because we had to actually knock them out and then take a biopsy of their tonsils, which leads to a lot more bleeding than the rectal. The rectal that we're doing today, we don't have to knock the deer down. It's a fairly quick process and a lot easier on the deer. Although I do worry after years and years of taking rectal samples, what repercussions that could have for the deer. You know, obviously, uh, you know, taking a snippet out of the rectum is invasive to the deer and it's gonna create scar tissue. We're very careful to try to take it at like the 12 o'clock position next year at the six o'clock and then on from there. But it is a concern that, you know, later on in the year's life that we may not be able to get enough tissue sample to get a good test from. It's also natural regression and how much tissue, how much lymphoid tissue remains just as they get older. Young deer have a lot, old deer have very little patches of that lymphoid tissue. Uh, at this point, I'm not sure if we're not able to get good samples, we'll probably have to switch to a tonsil test on those deer, and then you can only take so many bites out of the tonsils. So I don't think anybody's tested deer to this extent to really know how many years you can do these tests on them. I believe ultimately, if we weren't able to get successful live tests for the deer, we'd have to do a post-mortem test, which means that we'd have to euthanize the deer. Some of these bucks, before they get brought to the release site will have been tested as many as four or five times with a live test. And then once we harvest them, we are also required to post-mortem test those deer 100%. And you may be wondering who's paying for all this. Ox Ranch Genetics is paying for it. Hundreds of thousands of dollars in deer feed, testing, labor, so much money spent on it. And worst of all, hundreds of deer lost their lives from one positive CWD deer. So I said earlier about wanting to be aggressive, take the aggressive approach to this. So not only did we live test every single one of the deer in our facility, we collected tissue samples, sent them off to the lab, had Dr. Seabury study them, group them, and give us results on which deer in our herd were either more or less susceptible to CWD. Yeah, at the end of the day, we ended up killing 400 and I want to say 22, 420 some odd uh, over the span of a couple days. Uh, it really does suck. You, you work for hours upon hours upon hours, years of your life raising some of these deer and then it's out of nowhere you get told, hey, you have to kill off two-thirds of your herd, and it hurts. When we found out we had a CWD positive, we had close to a thousand deer in the pen. And when we got down, we only had a, about 700 deer left because we were locked down from the state and we, we couldn't separate bucks and older bucks and breeder bucks and we lost a lot of genetically durable deer through this time frame waiting on this herd plan. So it wasn't for five months after we received positive results that a herd plan was even talked about. It was 10 months before we had one signed. And if it's that important of an issue, why did it take so long to get a herd plan? Since that deer was euthanized, that tested positive, we have post-mortem tested 771 deer, not a single positive. That's a lot of deer. If it's that big of a deal and it spreads so easily, tell me how 771 deer can come back, not detected, that shared the same pens, went to the same barn, drank at the same water trough, ate at the same feeder with that deer for two years. 
certainly it, it doesn't appear that it behaved in that herd the same way that it behaves in other herds. And I think that I know at, at, at least part of, a big part of the answer to that question, and that is the positive buck that was purchased was co-housed with bucks and with a set of does in two breeding seasons that were all really genetically superior. About 88% of them passed the cutoff and there were a lot of good codon alleles that were present among those deer. And so I think that co-housing with more durable deer just didn't allow the disease to take root and disseminate. Unfortunately, we lost those good deer because on the Leave No Doubt plan, my advice was that we needed to euthanize them just as a way of saying, let's leave no doubt that the disease can disseminate. Let's take out the animals that are most likely to become positive at some point in the future, if they are, or even if they're not, we didn't want to take any chances. So those animals were removed from the breeding population. And because of that, we actually lost some very good deer from Ox Ranch Genetics. Putting these deer down that were exposed directly to the buck, killing his offspring, and then agreeing to genetically test all these deer, knowing full well that there were a lot of deer that I was going to lose. It was a difficult decision, and I don't want people to think that we came out of this without some scars. We went from over a thousand deer in the breeding pen to just over 250 that were left that showed these genetic signs to durability of CWD. But we simply couldn't take any chances to have deer that were susceptible to CWD left in our herd. And, and we get to rebuild with these genetically durable deer. Before we would select deer for their pedigree or antler traits or different things like that. But this year, the sole thing we were looking at was combining SS bucks with GG does in different values to try to increase the overall genetic durability of CWD within our herd. So even though our numbers are not even close to what they used to be, we're still not as bad off as other ranches that have had to totally depopulate their whole herd. And we have to follow stricter rules and stricter regulations. I do feel optimistic about the future. We have 250 of the best deer that you can have as far as resistance to CWD goes. I think this is a good tool for other breeders now that they can start looking at these genetic breeding values of the deer. If this had been available to me when I purchased that breeder buck, his breeding value was very positive in a GG and I would have never purchased that deer and brought him into my facility even back then. So I think this is something that people could look at and make wise choices for moving with the future of their programs. How do we perform this test? What do we need to perform this test? And really all you need is a, a simple ear punch with the AllFlex tools that uh, many breeders already use for getting their parentage. In fact, you can get your parentage in this test all together with that same simple ear punch. CWD in a breeding facility was always a, a death sentence, both literally and uh, e economically for the breeder. It doesn't seem that this is always necessary anymore. It seems that the, the playbook has changed a bit because now we see that there are examples of herds where they might have received a positive deer, uh, but the disease did not disseminate in the herd. And of course, we know that the heritability of differences in susceptibility is high. That tells us that a lot of genetic improvement can be made. And now we're, we're actually seeing a demonstration project where we're doing that at Ox Ranch Genetics and we're re reducing our risk sequentially every single year that we breed for enhanced levels of, of resistance, we are reducing our risk. So I don't think that CWD is necessarily a death sentence for breeders anymore. I think that, that there are new options and, 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 and new best management strategies that can be implemented that, that would take us away from the need for total and immediate depopulation in the future. When we first found out we had a positive CWD case, I was devastated. I'd put a lot of work and labor into that deer program and we were just starting to get that program to where our goal was. It has set us back, but 
you know, finding this way to possibly keep our herd and give another option to other breeders in the future if their situations were similar. We had to go on the leave no doubt plan. We've worked hard and it's looking positive for us. And uh, the fact that that deer has been two and a half years since entering our facility with a non another detect is uh, proof, I believe, that uh, what we're doing could work in the future for other breeders as well. Without breeders as a vehicle to study CWD and to prove how we can engage in certain management practices and genetic selection to mitigate the prevalence of CWD, we would all just be sort of bystanders watching CWD unfold in front of us in the wild, in breeding facilities, elsewhere. Without breeders, we would not be able to learn what we've learned about how to selectively breed these deer to reduce the prevalence. We would not understand that there are big differences in susceptibility that naturally occur among white-tailed deer. I think that the end game has to be that the breeders lead an initiative to reduce CWD, uh, the prevalence and the probability of it occurring in their herds nationwide, and in doing so, that's good for everyone. CWD knows no bounds. I mean, it, it doesn't stop at a fence. And what's good for the breeders is good for everyone in terms of reducing the prevalence of CWD. My feelings about Chris Seabury. I mean, I have nothing but good feelings for Chris Seabury, actually. If it wasn't for Chris Seabury, I don't know that we would be in the position that we are right now. There's, I can't think of enough. Putting the time and effort in, into this test that's allowing us to, to be where we are today. Because it was either this or complete depop. Thanks to this testing, pretty optimistic and, and hopeful for positive things in the future. It's the selective deer breeding from us deer breeders that are going to be the solution for CWD, not, not deer in the wild. And so ultimately it wound up where we were only left with about 256 deer to restart our program with, but at least we, we are able to restart our program with these genetically durable deer and we'll be allowed to start releasing bucks again this next fall. And before we close out this program, I'm excited to tell you that the results have come back from the lab on the third round of live testing. A total of 2,500 live tests have been done so far at Ox Ranch Genetics with no more positive cases of CWD. It appears that this new genetic research on CWD is proving to be one of the most positive things to ever happen in recent years and the future looks brighter for deer breeders and for the white-tailed deer enthusiasts everywhere thanks to the hard work that's being done at Ox Ranch Genetics with Texas A&M University and Dr. Christopher Seabury. My name is Keith Warren and thanks for watching. The preceding program was made possible thanks to the generosity of the Servid Livestock Foundation. And if you're concerned about chronic wasting disease, this video, I believe, is going to be very informative, and I think that you're going to walk away having a different perspective on it. Joining me is Dr. Christopher Seabury. He is the leading scientist and researcher for the North American Deer Registry.